I feel it in my fingers. I feel them in my toes. Feel them in my toes. Love is all a shite. Oh, I screwed up. Oh, man, I gotta do. Okay, redo the take. Through. Two, three, four. I feel it in my fingers. I feel it in my toes. Feel it in my toes. Christmas is all around me. And so the feeling grows. So the feeling grows. Hey guys, the Black Critic Guy back with another edition of my BCG Movie Countdown to Christmas. We're now on day number three, ladies and gentlemen. And after the debacle that was day number dos with this Christmas, we are now washing the palette of that disgustingness. And we're actually talking about not only one of my personal favorite Christmas movies, but honestly, one of the greatest Romance movies I personally have ever seen or has ever been made in my opinion. In fact, a very, very, very long time ago, when I was working for a certain media company here on Guam, I actually did a list of the top 10 best romance films. This movie was included on that list. I believe it was either number 6 or number 7. I don't remember, but I know it was definitely in the top 10. Because I, I truly and actually love this movie and what movie is that why it's love actually <laughs> yes i know i'm sorry I'm, i can't resist it the movie title itself just makes you want to say it in that way you know anywho let's get to the the video shall we so anyway what is love actually well it's uh actually about well you guessed it love in fact, it's a bunch of interconnected love stories following various characters as it all builds up to Christmas Day. Well, in, in the movie, technically it builds up to Christmas Eve. You actually don't really see Christmas Day, but it, it's leading up to Christmas, basically. Uh, and again, you're just following a series of characters, all of them dealing with different aspects of love in their lives and how they deal with it. That's, that's the straight and narrow of the film. It goes without saying, guys, you know, and many of you who are fans of me for a very long time already know, I'm a sucker for romance. I have always been a sucker for romance. Romance stories are always my favorite stories to see in films. I, I, I eat that shit up. No matter how cliche or derivative they are, if they're entertaining or charming in any way, shape, or form, and I like the leads, the romantic leads in the film, I will love that movie, or I'll really, really enjoy it. And Love Actually is no exception. But here's the thing, and I, I'm, this is actually why I'm very glad that I'm doing this series, because I'm revisiting old films I haven't seen in a while. I haven't seen Love Actually in about maybe four years. And the true hallmark of a good movie, in fact, scratch that, the true hallmark of a great movie is where you can watch it again and take something new from it. And watching Love Actually once again, I have grown a new appreciation for this film. And I have noticed things about the film that I didn't notice before. And I'm not talking about the countless upon countless of actors who, who were in this film before they became famous. I mean, where were you? Martin Freeman is in this film. Martin Freeman, who will become Watson later on, and of course Bilbo Baggins, he, this was actually, I think this might have been his theatrical debut, because he was mostly known as a television actor in England, and then I think this might have been one of his first films. You have him in this, you got like, freaking, I think his name is Andrew Lincoln, Andrew Lincoln, he's the guy that will later go on to be in The Walking Dead. He plays the main character whose name I'm also forgetting. Ah, oh, Jesus. I forgot what his name is. I remember his son's name is Carl, but I don't... Rick! His name is Rick! He goes on to play Rick in uh, The Walking Dead. He's in this movie. Chuta Ejiofor is in this movie. He will later become an Oscar-nominated actor later, later in his life. Who else? 
was, oh, my favorite. Thomas Sanger. Sang, Sangster. Sorry, not Sanger. Sangster. That little kid in the movie. He goes on to be, ooh, he's a, I forgot what his name is in Game of Thrones. But he's the kid that teaches Bran how to warg into uh, his direwolf better. So he becomes that character. And, fun fact, he's also the voice of Ferb from Phineas and Ferb. And the girl that plays his love interest in this movie, her name is Joanna. <laughs> Talk about the most interesting coincidence. And I, I was blown away when I found this out many years ago. His love interest in the movie will later on grow up to be the voice of Vanessa in Phineas and Ferb. And Ferb has a crush on Vanessa, just like the little kid in this movie has a crush on Joanna. It was almost like it was meant to be. And I don't know if that was done intentionally, by the way, by uh, Dan Polmeyer and um, Swampy Marsh, or Jeff Swampy Marsh. Maybe, maybe it was done on purpose, but I find that interesting. What a weird little coincidence that they would play love interests in two separate mediums. Or media, I should say. There's no such thing as mediums. Media. So I, I found that interesting. So, so many people show up in this film. Cameos, uh, reoccurring characters. Hell, Ro Rowan Atkinson is in this movie for just two scenes. And both scenes he's in... Dynamite, just amazing scenes. And I again, I know I sound like I'm sucking up to this movie, but I really like watching it again. I find it even more funny than I did when I was younger. The fact that because you have Alan Rickman's characters buying this necklace for his secretary, and he's trying to make it a quick thing before his wife comes around the corner, and Rowan Atkinson is just like being the most extra person that has ever existed. He's like, no, no, don't worry. I'll do it in a quick bit. And he's literally doing what I would consider like a Mr. Bean S scene in this romantic comedy. And it's just a delight. It's hilarious. He scoops up some chocolates. He pours it in. He scoops up some, uh, <laughs> I think it's like basil. He's like, you know, puts it in. Then he takes one of them specifically, crushes them up and goes like that. He takes out a, a cinnamon stick. He's like, Mm, oh, yes, perfect. It goes along with it. Okay, now let me put on this glove and I'm going to put it in this box. Exact Again, the most extra. And some people might feel like that was such a frivolous scene. I loved it. It was perfectly done. Great comedic bit in the film. And they really utilized Rowan Atkinson quite well for his one major scene. He had one other scene at the airport where he helped the little kid to sneak past the uh, ticket people. Again, not a wasted character. There's, there's just so much to gush about this movie. I, I don't even know where to truly start. I mean, I'm, I have been talking about all the actors that have appeared in it. But, like, it's just a... It, if I were to sum up this movie in just one word, I would say that it is charming. It is utterly charming. Every single story in this film, minus maybe two, are just... A delight. They're they're uplifting. They're joyous. They're cute. That it just it makes it puts a smile on your face, and I enjoyed them thoroughly. But what I will say is something that I caught on to, or let me rephrase that: something that I recognize better now than I did when I was younger is I think what makes this film so great is it's not just one type of love story that you see in the film. In fact, there are a multitude of different types of love stories in this particular film, which honestly is one of the reasons why I personally think it is one of the greatest romance films ever made. Because it's not just like, oh, boy meets girl, boy loves girl, you know, boy and girl have sex, they get married, the end. Yeah, there's some stories like that, like with Colin Firth and the uh, Portuguese girl, the Prime Minister with Natalie, yeah, those are the boy meets girl cliche stories for the, you know, the avid romantic comedy fan. But there are some really dark ones, really sentimental ones, and ones that are actually quite profound. One of which 
that I don't think I appreciated the first time around. And even when I was watching the movie with my girlfriend today, I was even like, oh, this girl's cheating on her husband. That's what's happening. Totally forgetting that that's not exactly what happened. It's uh, Laura Linney's character. I believe, hold on. I, I, made a, I made a list. Don't worry. We'll get to the list later. But I believe her name is Sarah. Yes. So it was Sarah's love story. So Sarah, played by Laura Linney, she's in love with this guy at her job named Carl. Who, fun fact, played by the same guy that played Xerxes in 300. I was, when I saw him in the movie many years ago, and I'm like, hey, that guy looks familiar. What's his name again? Oh my God, is that Rodrigo Santoro? The guy that was Xerxes and he played Jesus in that one shitty Ben-Hur movie? Holy shit, he's in this movie too? Wow. Wow, again, going back to what I was saying earlier about Young actors who have not broken out into this into like mainstream culture yet. This is some of their first starts. I believe this might have been his like first movie as well. I don't quote me on that, but it was the first movie I think that was a big movie he was in. And again, he would later go on to be Xerxes. He would also be a voice in Rio, which I hated his character in Rio. And also he played Jesus in Ben Hur. So interesting to see him in this film. Anywho. Their love story, and just the story in general was so interesting, because it's not just a, a love story, it's, it's a tragic love story. Because, spoiler alert, well I'm going to spoil anyway, spoiler alert, they don't end up together at the end of the film. In fact, she chooses to support her brother over her own happiness. And I actually like that the film had a love story like that in here. A love for one sibling who is you know, mentally unwell, and she takes care of him. She sacrifices a bit of her happiness to make sure that her brother is okay and well taken care of. That felt so real and grounded. And in a lesser movie, it would feel a bit jarring to see it in this film. But for this movie, it worked perfectly. It actually melded very well with the other stories. It wasn't wacky, goofy, over-the-top whimsy. It was more down-to-earth, realistic, and I related to it a lot. You know, as someone that had to take, some, take care of someone who was also very ill, you have to make a lot of sacrifices for those people. They can't take care of themselves. They, rule, they rely on other people. And I felt really bad for Laura Linney's character, Sarah. You know, she sacrificed her love, her love life, so that her brother is taken care of. And I respected her a lot. And I respected the filmmakers for sticking to their guns and telling this story. I bet you the studio was like, can we scratch that one? That doesn't really fit the really whimsical romantic comedy drive we're going for here. But I'm glad that they kept it. There was a really powerful scene where she goes visits him. Because he's he feels like the nurses are trying to kill him and all that stuff. And he's about to strike her. She already knows it's coming. Holds him, at, holds his hand and just looks at him in his eyes like, don't do that. Don't do that. Very powerful scene. In fact, this movie has a bunch of them. Don't worry. Well, we'll get to them later, I promise. But I love that they told that love story. I also loved, in fact, I love this story, but I also hate it. I like that they told a story of infidelity. That's the story with Alan Rickman. He's married to Emma Thompson's character, but he's in love, or at least he's attracted to his secretary, who has the hots for him as well. And as much as I don't like the story itself because I don't like stories of infidelity, the fact that the film addresses that type of love story is important. This is a film about love stories. You can't just tell the same love story because it gets boring. The fact that there's such diversity in the love stories, I think it's great. I think it's awesome. I like the fact that there's this really simple one with two porn star actors who are so used to just like humping each other and being in these sexual situations. They talk so casually to one another. And then he, Martin Freeman's character, just is like, hey, would you like to like, you know, maybe do something for Christmas or something? You know, and it's such so charming. So charming. A simple scene like that or like a simple premise of just two porn stars who are pretty casual with each other despite that they're doing something so intimate. I thought that was really cool. There's unrequited love, there's young love, there's lost love. I mean, the sibling love, 
a love for a father and his stepson. That that might be one of my favorites. Liam Neeson plays a character. His name is hold on, let me look. His name is Daniel, I believe. Yes. His name is Daniel. And he marries this woman who already had a kid. She dies. He takes care of the stepson. You know, not his actual son. But the fact that he is going above and beyond to help him express his love, I thought was amazing. Liam Neeson killed it. Thomas Sang Sang Sangster. God, terrible pronunciation. I thought they had really good chemistry, and I love how at the end of the film he calls him dad. He calls him dad. It's and it's so subtle too, because he doesn't even make a big deal about it. He does go, "Did you just call me dad?" He just smiles and is like, "Let's go get that girl." And I just love that that payoff right there. A very subtle payoff, a payoff that I don't think the audience was hoping for, but we got nonetheless. And I appreciated that. Again, I just love the diversity of stories in this film. I love the characters, a majority of them at least. I already mentioned Rowan Atkinson's character, but I, I, I have a soft spot for Colin Firth's character and uh, Hugh Grant's characters. They, they, they play the same characters that they were known for playing in the late 90s, early 2000s. You know, like the four weddings and a funeral or something. Or how Bridget Jones' diary. They, they basically are playing the same characters. They're just in love, actually. But their love stories are so freaking charming, dude. The Hugh Grant plays the Prime Minister of England. I think his name is... Hold on, his name is... David? His name is David, yeah. So he is the Prime Minister of England, or the UK, I guess. And he has this, um, I wouldn't say it's his waitress or his secretary. I think she works in the catering department or something. Her name is Natalie. And they kind of just hit it off. They have like this really quirky, awkward kind of exchange effect. <laughs> That's actually what makes it so cute. It's just so awkward and cutesy a little bit you know there was a misunderstanding between them because he caught her with the president and they looked like they were getting really touchy-feely so he just like oh okay well let's just get rid of her but then he realizes wait a minute you know she was actually pretty down to earth i should go and find her that scene where he goes to her neighborhood and goes door to door trying to find her that again another really cliche kind of thing you know where the main character the main male love interest is going door to door to find his true love I liked how they executed it. You know, each door he knocked at was a different type of person. One is an old lady, one was a group of kids, and he ends up singing, on the trace of, of Stephen, something. I don't know what that song is called. The King of Westershire, whatever. And then he even bumps into the girl that Alan Rickman's character is having a sort of affair with. So it's just, again, it's a cliche concept executed extremely well and i rooted for their romance then there's colin Firth's character a guy that his girlfriend cheats on him with his brother with his, with his freaking brother he goes on a trip to france to get away to write a story i guess he's a writer the, the film doesn't really tell us if he's a writer or not it's assumed that he's a writer i i'm pretty sure he's a writer and he has this maid who's Portuguese, that takes care of his house. They have this little, like, cultural misunderstanding type of relationship because she speaks Portuguese. He doesn't truly really understand Portuguese. They, they have this one scene where he's, she, she's delivering tea to him, accidentally lifts it, and his papers just fly off into this little pond, lake area. She, like, jumps in, gets all out of her clothes, and Colin first staring at her in her, like, underwear and stuff. It's like, oh, very nice. Oh, very nice. And they both jump into the lake. Well, she jumps into the lake. Freaking call it first, like, freaking derps into the lake. Like, oh, oh, oh! <laughs> Falls into the lake. <laughs> so, and again, just really cute, charming, very cliche nowadays, but executed brilliantly. And that scene where he flies all the way to Portugal, goes to her house, meets her father, is like, I'd like to marry your daughter. Then he introduces another daughter of his, a more um, heftier one. And she's like, I don't know who this guy is. Like, oh, well, no, no, not that daughter, your daughter Aurelia. And oh, she's at work. And literally, it seems like they just got the whole village to follow him. 
as he's going to propose to Aurelia while she's at work serving customers. And that whole scene, just the lead up to it and the moment he actually confesses his love and proposes to her. What, what I loved about it is that they both were trying to learn each other's languages as a way to connect with one another because he speaks broken Portuguese and then she is learning English and she speaks broken English. Again, just so freaking charming. Ah, I, ca I can't stop gushing about this movie. It's so freaking good. It's so freaking good. Even Billy Mack's story with his manager. Originally, I thought that it was going to be like, oh, they're gay for each other. But if you really look at the context of it, it's not about him being gay for his manager. He just feels this brotherly love towards his manager. You know, he's been with them through thick and thin. He's been with them through all of the catastrophes. He's been with them with all of his public shenanigans and controversies. And he's just like, instead of going to Elton John's party with all these sexy women and these the drugs and the hookers and stuff, I would rather just be with a person that truly cares about me and that I truly love as well. So how about we just get pissed and let's go watch some porno together. We'll whack, we'll whack each other off, you know? Again, it's a bit strange, it's a bit awkward, but it's a unique take on the concept of love. Because again, what if it's like brotherly love? What if it's a friendship love? Like a deep love for a dear friend. Someone that's been there for you forever. And again, uh, what's so brilliant about this movie? Different types of love stories. They're not all the same. There's such variety. And I even didn't I didn't even get to the most iconic one, the the unrequited love story with uh Ada or Andrew Lincoln, Kira Knightley, and uh Chuatal Ejiofor. You got Adam Lincoln's character who's hold on, let me let me look at my paper. His name is um Mark. His name is Mark. So Mark is best friends with a guy named Peter. And Peter's getting married to a girl named Julia. He's at the wedding and stuff. They do this whole thing. Of, All you need is love. Right? They do the whole thing. And then we later find out Mark has feelings for Peter's wife, Juliet. That he cannot act upon. Nor can he confess because it would cause awkwardness, obviously. But she thinks that Mark hates her. Juliet thinks Mark hates her and she's trying desperately to just be friendly with him and then she later finds out because she's looking for a tape that he took of the wedding and after looking at the tape she notices something which is again one of those brilliant scenes in the movie. There's a lot of moments in the movie where it's just no dialogue is being said but the music really encapsulates the mood of the scene and in this scene she's literally watching this tape that uh, Mark recorded of the wedding but realizes it's not really about the wedding it's about her all the shots are about her and without even saying it we get the con we get the context she understands it he is feeling awkward about it and he's just like frustrated because he he wants to be with this woman he knows he can't be with her and it leads to one of the most iconic scenes in the movie. It's the scene where he pretends he's a caroler. He's holding up the signs and it has like words in there. <coughs> and says like all these nice things and saying, you know, my heart is for you always. I will always love you even though I can't be with you. And, you know, he's walking away. Kira Knightley comes up, gives him a kiss on the lips and then that's it. And then he says, enough. That's enough. Kind of thing. And then he moves on. What I loved about that is that it doesn't end up in that cliche thing of, you know, Kira Knightley abandons True Tall Edgy for because despite the fact that we don't know much about his character, I'm sure he's a good guy. I, he, he doesn't seem like he hates uh, Juliet. He doesn't seem like he's abusive. She does seem to generally care about him, but maybe she's also, like, touched by this romance or this this affection that Mark has also shown her. And wants to, you know, at least pay it back a little bit. She doesn't chase after him or do the cliche thing. She sticks with her marriage. She accepts his feelings despite the fact she can never really reciprocate them. And Mark also understands, I can't have you reciprocate it. Because Mark's, or uh, 
Peter's my best friend. I don't want that to happen. I love that. There's only really one type of love story in this film I didn't like, which was the casual love story. There's this one British guy. Uh, his name is fucking Colin. His fucking name is Colin. And he's, he's basically just a fuck boy. He wants, to, he wants to get fucked by an American girl because British girls are just too uptight. They're too snooty. They, they don't care for guys like me. I'm going to go to America where I can get nailed all night and all night long. And the reason I didn't really like this one is not only is it extremely cliche, but it seemed a bit too unbelievable. And I, I hate to say unbelievable in this type of film. It's a lot of unbelievable moments. But the fact that he flies out to fucking Milwaukee, meets three of the hottest girls in the entirety of Milwaukee, and he has a threesome with them, or I guess foursome. What? It would have been more believable if he went there and they stole all of his shit and then he was a he was stuck in America. That would have been funny. That would have been great. It would have been fitting. Because it felt like his story should have been more of a comeuppance story. Like, oh, you thought you were going to find love. Actually, you didn't. I, I didn't do that on purpose, by the way. I didn't mean to do that on purpose. <laughs> that just kind of came out. It just kind of came out. But the fact that he fucking nails these three hot girls and then at the end of the movie he gets freaking Shannon Elizabeth from American Pie to be his girlfriend and then he introduces his best friend whose name is Tony coincidentally introduces him to Denise Richards now her, she's not Denise Richards in the movie it's like the friend she's called the friendly one in the film introduces him to Denise Richards' character, and she's like, yeah, you know, I'm very friendly. Gives Tony a kiss on the lips. Like, what the fuck? And, uh, that's stretching it a little bit right there. You know, I'm not buying that so much. Uh, something else I wanted to cover, too. I like some of the slower moments, some of the more quieter moments. I'm, I'm going to say quiet in quotations, because they're not technically quiet. There is music playing that's thematic to the emotions happening in the scene. There's this great moment where Emma Stone, or Emma Stone, Emma Thompson's character who's married to Alan Rickman, the one that's buying the necklace for his secretary, she finds the necklace in his pocket, assuming it was for her, sees the box underneath the Christmas tree thinking that was for her, then when she finally opens it on Christmas Day, it's a CD of Joni Mitchell, and, you know, she's taken aback by it, but she's trying to hide it very well. And she's like, okay, I'm going to just step out. And, you know, we listen to the Joni Mitchell music. And it really conveys the torn emotions that she's feeling. Very great acting in that scene by Emma Thompson. She's, she's always been a phenomenal actress. But really great acting. I, I like that slow moment, that somber moment, really where we collect. And we really feel for the character. Like, it took its time. And it didn't rush that scene. It let it breathe and it showed it all for what it was and I thought it was perfectly executed and I, I haven't given much praise yet I know I've talked a lot about the characters but I love the acting in the film I felt like every person gave a phenomenal performance from the small little ones to the big ones they all did very well some of them were very typecasted some of them went far and beyond I thought Emma Thompson was one of the people that went far and beyond Laura Linney obviously went far and beyond in in Actually, Rodrigo Santoro did very good, too. You know, so many great little performances, so many great big performances. The way, the awkward exchanges between Martin Freeman and just Judy, the character he falls in love with. Perfect. That awkwardness actually adds to the comedy. Speaking of which, movie's fucking hilarious. I was laughing throughout the entire film. It was delightful. And what's even... What's even more interesting, I complained in my last video that this Christmas was way too fucking long. It was nearly two hours long. This movie is two hours long. It's two hours and 15 minutes, and I didn't feel a single minute of it. I was so invested in this film, invested in the characters, invested in the story, invested in this world. I got lost in it, and I didn't even realize two hours went by. I loved the movie that much. And that's how you know a movie is really good, where the length of it does not bother you. In bad movies like This Christmas, the length bothers you because you're so damn bored and you're not invested. But in a movie like Love Actually, where the creators actually 
took the time to flesh these scenarios and these characters out, you don't even feel it. The time goes by so quickly. And you just realize, wait a minute, damn, I missed all of this. Oh, man, this is... Oh, man, I would have loved some more moments with this. And that, that's another big problem I have with the film is that because there's so many stories, some stories don't get much focus compared to others. Now, the ones that did get the most focus, deservingly so. They deserved the focus. The story between uh, the writer guy. Wait, hold on. His name is Jamie. The writer guy, Jamie and Aurelia. Yeah, that deserves a lot of screen time. The one with David and Natalie deserves a lot of screen time. The one between Daniel, Sam, Joanna, and then later on the girl that Liam Neeson's character Daniel bumps into. Deserving of a lot of screen time, you know? But that means that a lot of the love stories didn't get a lot of screen time. I personally would have loved to see more of Martin Freeman's character and the Just Judy character. How, how that happened more. We get sporadic moments with them. Cute, sentimental, but like we don't learn much about them. Nor do we really see how their relationship grows from where it was. Like it would have been fun. You know what would have been really funny? If well, after they go on a date... They go upstairs to one of their houses and they try to have sex, but then they, they're they really awkward about it. It's like, what what do I do? And what, It'd be funny because it's almost ironic. They're porn actors and they don't know how to have sex with each other intimately by themselves without the camera being rolling. So I, I thought that would have been hilarious. They missed the opportunity there. It would have been nice to see more of, what was his name, Billy Mac? Is this Billy? Yeah, Billy Mac and Joe, his... Manager, it would have been nice to see more scenes with them and their bonding and stuff. And how, you know, he sticks his neck out for Billy all the time and Billy seems ungrateful, but he actually kind of gives a damn. It would have been nice to see more scenes of that. We don't get much. Uh, Laura Linney, the one thing I don't like about how her story ends is I feel like she did deserve a happy ending. Though realistic that she didn't get one. In my heart, I wanted her to get a happy ending. As cliche as it is, I did want her to get a happy ending. I felt like the story between the Prime Minister and Natalie needed a little bit more fleshing out. It was it was solid, but it could have been better, is what I'm saying. Uh, and I think the most capital sin that this movie made is something that it didn't do intentionally... But I'm going to hold it accountable because it did start the trend. And that is the fact that it's because of this movie that we got the trend of the big star-studded cast movies that all tell a story surrounding a certain holiday or a certain theme. And you know what I'm talking about. Your Valentine's Days, your New Year's Eve, your Mother's Day. The ones that that fucking Gary Marshall guy always makes. I feel like he watched Love Actually and he thought to himself, hey, I can do the same thing, but put less effort into doing them. I can make the characters one-dimensional and just do these really cheeky scenes and not flesh out my characters, put them in these scenarios, and then that's it. I got Love Actually. But it's not actually Love Actually. And that's the problem is that you have all of these rip-off movies that tried to do the same thing Love Actually did, but they didn't put forth the effort and actually learned how they made that film, what made that film successful. You know, when I see films like Valentine's Day and especially New Year's Eve, the, the problem I have is that they all just feel samey. Even though I get that they were trying to tell different stories, they still felt samey in a way. Not to mention, again, the characters are just really hollow. Like, you don't really care much about them. Even the core characters, you don't really care much about them. And that's the one capital sin I feel like Love Actually committed is that it started the trend of these star-studded celebrity movies surrounding a holiday or these, how do I say it? These celebrity-heavy thematic or holiday thematic movies. I'm losing the words here, but you know the movies I'm talking about. It started that trend. Thank goodness it's dead now. We don't see movies like that anymore. And that's great. We don't need to see movies like that no more. Because Love Actually was the first one to truly do it effectively. And no one has been able to replicate the formula 
perfectly or even just slightly good. Every time there's been a replication of Love Actually, it always missed the mark. Because there really is only one Love Actually. And again, I can't sing the praises of this film enough. It's a solidly made film. It has everything that any fan of romance would want. You want a, you want a quirky, silly, awkward love story? Here you go. You want a sentimental love story? Here you go. You want a casual love story? Here you go. You want one that's about uh, sibling love? Here you go. You want one that's about a father's affection for his son who's trying to confess his love? Here you go. It, you want one that's a tragic, unrequited love story? Here you go. You get everything. The movie offers everything. It does not shortchange you at all for what you're looking for. And I forgot, there's one more praise I will give this film. Sorry, I'm going all over the place. There's one more praise I'll give this film. I love the third act. The third act is well-paced, well-structured. It all crescendos to this... <laughs> This Christmas concert where the nativity scene includes aquatic animals like lobsters, octopus, and there's a shark and a whale, I think I saw. Which, I'd love to know how that happened. <laughs> I'd love to know who came up with that idea. I'm going to give you a raise because that was very unique and different. I like that a lot. But the third, and the third act has some of the most iconic scenes in the movie. In fact, it might be one of the few movies I know where the third act altogether is just full of so many memorable, iconic moments. You had the scene where Mark is basically telling his love to Sarah, right? And he's using the letter thing, right? Hold up, let me make sure that's the name, right? Yeah, Mark, is it? Oh, shoot. Mark and Juliet, my bad. Mark and Juliet, where Mark is confessing his love to Juliet using the paper. You have the epic scene where Sam, the little boy, is running through the airport. You know that cliche, I'm, I ran to the airport to confess my love. He did that too. And honestly, it's kind of funny because it's like post 9-11. It literally happened two years after this movie came out or before this movie came out. In fact, I'm actually wearing a 9-11 shirt now that I think about it. I... Did, didn't plan, did not plan that at all. Um, so it is interesting that he was able to get through security that easily. Maybe, maybe not the wisest of choices, but still an iconic scene. <coughs> you have the scene where, you know, Billy, Ma Billy Mac comes back to Joe's apartment and he confesses like, Hey man, I truly love you, bro. You're my brother. I love you to death. You're such a great person. God, that... That was such a good... And of course, the epic scene where Colin Firth's character, Jamie, flies out to Portugal, goes to Aurelia's home, sees her father, tells him he wants to marry his daughter. The other daughter comes out, who's a little bit heftier. Then they all head down to the, the restaurant she works at, and he confesses love. That's such an iconic scene. I, I have never forgotten about the scene. I've always loved that scene. Because he literally looked like he invited the entire village so that he they can hear his proposal to her. There's, of course, the iconic scene where um, the, the Prime Minister is knocking on all the doors leading up to finding his love, Natalie. And then, of course, the scene where they end up kissing, they open the curtains, and then they get seen. is like, so what do we do now? It's just like, you know, just smile. You know, give a little bit of a wave. You know, he's just like, roll with it. Can't avoid it now. You know, they see us. It is what it is. Or again, the, the all I want for Christmas is you scene. That's another iconic scene. And she points at uh, Sam. You. And then she turns around. And you. And you. And he goes, oh, man, damn it. I, I thought you meant like just me. I didn't know you meant everybody. So, so many iconic moments in that third act. The third act was perfectly executed. I have no problems with the third act at all. I think it... Helps to sum up the movie perfectly. Guys, in the end, what have I not said about this movie? <laughs> what have I not said about this movie that I need to address? I think I've nailed it all. I've rambled for almost 40 minutes. Jesus Christ. I'm so sorry. I feel like these videos are getting like longer and longer. A apologies. But seriously, I, I can't stop singing the praises for this film. I love it to death. It's only gotten better over time. I truly appreciate this film. 
It's it's a true delight. And that's why I think, despite some of the smaller issues I have, and the fact that I wasn't a fan of that one casual love story, I still think this film is an epic masterpiece. Like, how could you not say it's an epic masterpiece? Like I said before, it gives you everything that you would want in a romance film. It gives you almost every love story under the sun, minus like love for AI, which didn't exist at this time. It gives you everything. It misses no beats. The characters are all charming to a certain degree. The stories are entertaining. Some of them relatable. Some of them heartfelt. Some of them tragic. It has it all. If you've not seen Love Actually, please see it. I don't care if it's Christmas. I don't care if it's Lee Ferrickson Day. I don't care if it's... Um, the El Elthelred the the fourth when he massacred the Saint Bride's Day massacre day. Just watch it. It's a great film. Watch it with a spouse. My girlfriend loved the movie, and she doesn't like long movies. She loved this movie. So go check it out, guys. And before we end, I did actually. This is why I was looking at the paper. I actually ranked all of the love stories in Love Actually. So if you would just give me a chance. Uh, I'm going to read to you from 1 to 9. There are 9 stories in this film. I rank them from best or from worst to best. So at the bottom, I mean, this goes without saying, it's the casual love story with Colin and the American girls. I didn't like its execution. I thought it was a bit too unrealistic. It could have been more funny if he was actually ripped off and he realizes that love sucks in any country. Uh, next would be Harry, Karen, and Mia. That's the one with Alan Rickman, Emma Thompson, and then the secretary girl. The reason I don't like this isn't because of how realistic it is, and I thought that the acting was really good. I just don't like stories about infidelity. This is the infidelity love story. Not too fond of it. Also, I didn't really feel like Alan Rickman's character really loved his secretary. He was just kind of attracted to her, and she was hot for... Her boss, for some reason, which is never really explained, nor do we know if they ever really consummated anything. I don't know. I just, I didn't care for it that much. Then next is uh, John and Just Judy, the two porn star actors. The, th the reason it's so low on the list is because we weren't really given a lot of moments with them. They didn't really flesh out their characters. They're cute. They're charming characters. Their romance is honestly really charming, but there's not much to it. There's not much depth to it. There's a lot of things that I felt like were missed opportunities. I mentioned them earlier, you know, the whole thing of they, they have sex with each other at work, but then when they actually have sex with each other privately, they don't know how to act. That would have been funny if they did that. The next love story is Billy Mac and Joe. Uh, this is similar to the one with John and Just Judy. I think if this was given more time to breathe, if they fleshed it out more, or had more scenes with Billy Mac and Joe bonding... I think this would have been a lot higher, especially because it's a unique love story that doesn't turn into a gay lover's story. It's just brotherly love, a good, strong friendship love kind of thing. It would have been nice to explore that. It was a unique story with a very eccentric character, but they could have gone further with it. Then, after that, we get into the top five. We start off with David and Natalie, the prime minister and his catering uh, manager or something. Again, I like it a lot. It's charming. It's cutesy. It's, it's, I would say, a quirkable, you know, adorable and quirky. And it's a little awkward. It has that Hugh Grant awkwardness that I really love. But I feel like it could have had more time to be fleshed out. I would have loved to see more scenes with David and Natalie. It just missed the mark a little bit there. But, it, I mean, it's in the top five. Number four is Juliet, Peter, and Mark. This is the iconic scene where Mark is... You know, holding up the paper and like that. I liked it for the mere fact this is the unrequited love story. I really felt for Mark. I felt his dilemma of loving your best friend's wife, but he can't act upon this love because he knows it's wrong. And he never once acts upon it, at least in a really terrible way is how I would phrase it. He doesn't do it in a malicious way. He's not trying to steal her. He understands and he respects the sanctity of their marriage, despite the fact that he does have feelings for her. I respect that a lot. I even respected the kiss. The kiss didn't feel like a 
lover's yearning kiss. It more felt like a kiss out of respect. Like, I appreciate your love. I, I still love Peter, but I appreciate, you know, that you feel that way. It's not a, I'm abandoning my husband for you thing. I like that. I like that they didn't take that cliche route where he cho where she chose Mark over Peter. She still loves Peter in a way. Uh, after that would be Sarah, Carl, and Michael. This is the tragic love story where Sarah has a mentally ill brother and she sacrifices her own love for taking care of her brother. I liked how it started off. It actually starts off very quirky. It starts off very uh, kind of comedic. But then as we actually see the love story unfold, it starts showing those darker segments, those dramatic segments. And again, I like how raw and real it is. I like how they don't hold any punches. And I do like the fact that it is kind of tragic because they don't end up together at all. That was daring to put that in this movie that's really quirky. So I appreciated that a lot. And then number one and number two really are interchangeable. It depends on my mood. I love both of them equally. But if I were to rank which one I like the most between the two. Number two would be David, Sam, Joanna, and I put in parentheses, and Carol. He, she's the girl that Liam Neeson's character, Daniel, bumps into at the end. She kind of felt shoehorned in. I think that's why I didn't make her number one. Cause, or I didn't make this story number one. Because I didn't like how they shooed in Carol at the end. I get it. It's kind of his consolation prize for caring for his stepson. But still, I don't think he had to do that. Everything else was working for the story. If he ended up with nobody but loves his son, that would have been perfect on its own. He doesn't need really a love interest, but they just tacked it on. But despite that, that whole story, excellently done. I love every bit of it. I love seeing him bonding with his stepson. I like the fact that he considers him a son and then he later considers him his father. I like the, the airport scene. I like that he got the kiss. I like the fact that he meets the girl again at the end of the film, which is awesome. It's everything about it just I loved except for the shoehorned Carol scene. And then, of course, last but not least, Jamie and Rilia. I mean, it's cliche. It's sappy. It's... It's Colin Firth being Colin Firth. But damn it, that scene where he goes to Portugal really nailed it. That scene alone made it number one in my opinion. Because that is such an iconic scene. It's such a great scene. It's well executed. It's, it makes you blush. It makes you smile. It makes you laugh. There's comedy. There's romance. It has everything, honestly. And just seeing their relationship unfold. Two different worlds coming together. How could I not make it number one? It's great. It's phenomenal. I loved it. Great. Great love story. It Honestly, if you took this love story out of love, actually, it could be its own film. That's how good I think it is. You know? And so those are my rankings. Uh, hopefully you appreciate that. Sorry that this video is literally almost an hour long. They're getting longer and longer. I don't know how to explain it. But I had a lot to say. I could gush about this movie forever. I love this movie immensely. I would highly recommend it if you've not seen it. It's not just a great movie for Christmas. It's just a great movie for romance lovers. And a great movie in general. So go check it out. But anyway, those are my thoughts. Let me know what you guys thought about Love Actually in the comment section below. And this, give me your rankings. If you've seen the movie, rank all the love stories. If you, don't, if you want to know which ones they are here, look at this paper really quickly. These are all of their names. Hopefully I can get this where it's not. So these are, this is my ranking. So <coughs> let me put it over here so there's more space so you guys can read it. So look at this closely and then tell me your ranking. Who do you have at the bottom of the list? Who do you have at number one? Comment below, let me know. I'm gonna stop talking now because it's literally 11 o'clock at the night. At night, you know, I should probably be sleeping or getting ready for work, but damn it, I gotta make this video. I just wanted to talk about Love Actually. I'm glad I get this chance to talk about Love Actually. I don't really get many moments to talk about this film, so I appreciate it. And I'm glad I got to watch this film after watching this Christmas. Even better, I didn't choose to watch this film. My girlfriend chose it. So you know what? I love you, darling. Thank you for picking this film for me. Or just thank you for picking the film in general. I'm glad that you picked it and I'm glad that you liked it. Anywho, guys, 
If you liked what you see here and you would like to see more, please subscribe to the channel. Like this video if you really enjoyed it. And I'm talking about in a second. The sucker for romance known as the Black Critic Guy. Till then, as always, peace YouTube. Mwah!